Today's video is sponsored by Hunter Killer. Halloween has come and gone, but if you want to keep those spooky vibes alive as we move into festive season, you should really check out Hunter Killer, the ultimate murder mystery subscription game for fans of true crime. Unlike watching an investigation unfold on TV, Hunter Killer makes you a part of the action, placing you in the shoes of a detective and tasking you with catching an elusive murderer. By solving puzzles, decoding ciphers, and examining clues, you'll progress through each box set and narrow down your list of suspects until you and your fellow detectives can pinpoint the perp. Not ready to subscribe? No problem. There are plenty of all-in-one experiences available in the Hunter Killer online store. In my experience, Hunter Killer is the perfect alternative to another samey night glued to a screen. My wife and I have just started the new season, trying to solve the murder of Beth Ferris Hendricks and covering the secrets that exist in the small town of Mallory Rock, and investigating its suspicious residents. So with Christmas fast approaching, it's the perfect time to either treat yourself, or to give that true crime lover in your life a gift that they can really sink their teeth into. Head over to hunterkiller.com forward slash lazy masquerade, and use promo code lazy to get $10 off your purchase. Again, take advantage of that $10 discount by going to hunterkiller.com forward slash lazy masquerade and using promo code LAZY and find out if you have what it takes to solve the mystery inside. October 4th, 2018 was just another ordinary day in Acatepec, one of Mexico City's poorest suburbs. 38-year-old Patricia Martinez Bernal was pushing a baby stroller through its steep and colourful streets basking in the beautiful weather. By her side was her boyfriend, Juan Carlos Hernandez, 33 years old. But the couple weren't as alone on their walk as they thought. They were being spied on from afar by police officers who were particularly interested in the stroller. Several women had recently gone missing in Ecatepec. One of them was Nancy Noemi Hitron, who disappeared from the face of the earth along with her two-month-old daughter, the cops believed that Patricia and Juan were behind their vanishings, and that the infant was now inside that very stroller. They acted fast, surrounding the couple shortly after they left their home. One of the officers approached the stroller and pulled away the blanket, concealing the baby inside. But what they found wasn't a baby. No. Inside the stroller was the torso of a fully grown woman, wrapped tightly in black plastic. The fact that a woman's torso had just been found wasn't newsworthy in itself, not in a Catepec at least. The suburb had the highest rate of femicide in the entirety of Mexico, so unfortunately, the sight of yet another dead woman didn't come as a shock to anyone. Like I said, this was just another ordinary day in a Catepec. But Patricia and Juan weren't your ordinary couple, and as the authorities were about to learn, this wasn't just a one-off slaying. Far from it. The officers immediately searched the couple's home. Inside their refrigerator, they found even more body parts wrapped in plastic. In a lot that the couple owned, they also discovered eight buckets covered in a thick layer of concrete. Once investigators had broken the concrete seals, they found what Juan and Patricia had been concealing in the buckets. A mass of human organs. It was determined that the remains belonged to eight separate women though DNA tests could only confirm who four of them were. This was unprecedented. Sure, Ekaterbeck was known as something of a woman's graveyard, but for the most part, those slayings were impulsive and unplanned. Patricia and Juan, however, had been systematically eradicating the female residents of the suburb, and they weren't shameless about it. They were proud. Both Patricia and Juan immediately confessed to taking the lives of 20 women in total. To say that Juan wasn't fond of women would be an understatement. He despised them. His mother had been particularly cruel to him as a young boy, tormenting him both physically and emotionally. She worked as a lady of the night, and would regularly invite strange men into their family home, forcing the young Juan to watch her please her clients. On top of that, one of his female caretakers also did unspeakable things to him and treated him like an animal. According to Juan, that was where his hatred stemmed from, and why he felt it was his duty to rid the world of as many females as possible. 
That, and the fact that he believed he was a demon that needed to drink human blood at least once every three months. And drink it, he did. After finishing off his victims, Juan would slice them up and turn their remains into dinners for himself and his girlfriend. Steaks, chili, tamales, his menu was eclectic. So, we know what Juan was getting out of all of this. He took pleasure in taking the lives of these women. He enjoyed eating their flesh. He thought he was a demon. The guy was clearly deranged. But what about Patricia? Why did she go along with all of this depravity? Well, Patricia had had a particularly difficult life. She ended up on the streets at a very young age, and had to sell her body to survive. It was while looking for new clients in a bar that she met Juan. According to her, he was the first man to treat her kindly and not hurt her, and said that he was very good with children, something she found admirable. Yeah, maybe she wasn't the best judge of character. When Patricia found the body of Juan's first victim back in 2012, she was, of course, appalled. And the only reason she didn't call the cops right then and there was because Juan assured her that she'd go down alongside him. After that, she began assisting him with his slayings, and soon developed a taste for blood herself, both figuratively and literally. So what was their modus operandi? Well, first, the couple would build a sense of trust with their victims, befriending their female neighbours and other women that they'd meet in Acatepec. Then, once they had gained their trust, Patricia would invite them into their home, telling them they had close to sell them at a huge discount, you know, because they were friends and all, or that they wanted to hire them as a housekeeper. Then, once they were inside, Patricia would lock the door. Juan would emerge and place the victim in a martial arts style joint lock. Then, using a large blade, he'd slit their throats. On two occasions, Patricia herself was the one who delivered the fatal slash. What the couple did with the remains varied depending on their mood. Sometimes, they'd simply dump the body in a river, or an empty lot, or a sewage canal. That never caused too much of a stir. This was a catapec after all. Other times though, the couple would dismember their victims in a bathtub, splitting them in half and slicing the meat from their bones, saving the best parts for one of their signature recipes. According to Patricia, they could get a kilo of steaks from one body alone. As for the organs, they either sealed them in the cement buckets, or fed them to their dogs. Yeah, those damn dogs. In the couple's minds, they were their undoing. You see, Juan and Patricia practiced Santeria, and had sold at least one set of their victims' bones to other believers. Juan and Patricia had promised their last four victims' hearts to Nuestra Señora de la Santa Muerte, Our Lady of Holy Death, but one of their dogs had gotten a hold of the last heart before they could make their offering. They believed that cost them the favour of their chosen deity, and that's the reason they were caught. In reality, the reason they were brought to justice had nothing to do with botched sacrifices and angry gods. It was actually thanks to their victims' mothers. The police themselves were doing very little to find these missing women, so their desperate madres came together to do some detective work of their own. After sharing all of the information that they had gathered, they discovered there was one thing their daughters all had in common. Patricia and Juan. They were either close family friends with the couple, had lived next door to them at one point or another, or were otherwise connected with them. One of the victims had even hosted Patricia and Juan in her own home when the couple were down on their luck financially. A kind act which came back to bite her. Many of the victims even had Patricia's number show up on their phone records shortly before they vanished. Whether they had known Juan and Patricia for years or just days, all of the victims had trusted the couple when they entered their home, and that misplaced trust was a mistake which they would all pay for with their lives. Without their mothers drawing this connection between their daughters and the couple, the police would have been none the wiser, and the evil duo would have continued their grotesque escapades. In their own words, they weren't going to stop until they'd taken the lives of a hundred women. Well, they reached 20% of that target. The media dubbed Juan and Patricia the Butchers of Acatepec, and their story caused public outrage in Mexico. 
The case truly shone a spotlight on just how many women were being slain, not just in Ecatepec, but in other suburbs of Mexico City, and just how little the authorities were doing to solve these murders. But, at least in this instance, justice was served. For their despicable actions, both Juan and Patricia were jailed for a total of 654 years. Thankfully, there is a glimmer of a happy ending to all of this. Remember the two-month-old that had gone missing? Well, after Patricia and Juan had eaten her mother, they sold the infant to another couple for 15,000 pesos. Investigators were able to track her down and returned her, alive and well, to her maternal grandmother. The couple who purchased her were charged with human trafficking. In January of 1983, a group of young boys were playing in a wooded area on Hoap Mountain near Seoul, South Korea. Little did they know, they were about to make a grisly discovery. One of the youngsters pointed out a mannequin lying in a pile of leaves in the distance, an odd thing to be in the middle of the woods. As they drew closer, they realized it wasn't a mannequin at all. It was the corpse of a young woman, frozen stiff with rigor mortis. Whoever she was, the anguished expression on her face suggested that she had died in great pain. Morticians estimated that she'd been dead for at least a month when the boys found her. Her fingerprints identified her as 24-year-old Kyung Hee Kim, a barbershop worker from the city. In parts of Asia, there are certain barbershops that offer more than just haircuts and provide other services to their male clientele, let's put it like that. Well, it was at one such barbershop that Miss Kim worked at. She needed the money, you see. With no external injuries to speak of, it was determined that Miss Kim had died from poisoning. It seemed unlikely that she would climb up Mount Hoop in the middle of winter just to take her own life, and given the nature of her work and the type of customers it attracted, police began their investigation at the barber shop. One of Kim's most loyal customers was a 42-year-old man named Dong Sik Lee, a plumber by trade. Lee's true passion, however, was photography. He'd won numerous awards for his work, something he couldn't help but bring up in conversation, and he often held private photo exhibitions for other enthusiasts. Detectives surprised Mr. Lee by knocking on his door one evening and asking him about the death of Miss Kim. Mr. Lee said that he didn't know anything about it, that he only enjoyed making use of Kim's professional services and nothing more. Naturally though, he couldn't help but bring up the fact that he was an award-winning amateur photographer. That admission proved to be his downfall. The investigators asked if they could see some of his pictures. Lee said he didn't have much time, but the investigators insisted. Lee capitulated and led them into the room where he kept his photos. Among all of these hundreds of photos were images of scantily clad women posing as murder victims. The investigators questioned Lee about them, to which he replied, I have an affection for cadavers. Well, the photos were obviously staged. These weren't pictures of real dead women. Lee's second wife was also in one of the photos, pretending to be dead, and in reality, she was alive and well. Clearly Lee was just a weird guy who viewed death as art, and was playing out his bizarre fantasy with paid models. But just as they were finishing up, one of the investigators noticed Lee stealthily trying to pocket one of the photos. He grabbed it from Lee's hand before sharing it with his colleagues. One by one, the detectives examined it and looked up at each other with knowing expressions. There was no mistaking it. It showed what appeared to be a dead Miss Kim lying on a pile of leaves wearing the same clothes she had been found in. They immediately searched Lee's basement and found 20 even more disturbing photos. They were all of Miss Kim, and they were time-sequenced, showing her writhing on the ground, clutching at her chest and gasping for air. They'd been taken as she lay dying. Lee was immediately taken into custody. Of course, he maintained that he hadn't taken Miss Kim's life, and that she was just another model, posing for the camera. He admitted that he had gone up to Hoop Mountain with Miss Kim, but that it was just for a photo shoot. 
He said he left the mountain without her, and that someone else must have come along after that and taken her life. Very coincidental. Well, it was obvious to everyone that playing pretend wasn't doing it for Mr. Lee anymore. He had taken things a step further and decided to live out his dark, twisted fantasy. When forensic specialists zoomed in on the photos of Miss Kim, they noticed that the hair on her skin was gradually drooping more and more in each consecutive picture, something that happens as a person perishes. That proved that she wasn't just acting. As it turns out, Lee had manipulated Miss Kim during one of his regular sessions at the barbershop. He had gone there many times over the course of three weeks, and charmed her with stories about the award-winning photos he had taken, the amazing exhibitions he had put on, and the models he had made famous. Oh, by the way, Miss Kim, you'd make a great subject yourself. I bet I could make you famous too, he had told her. After regular visits, he had gained Miss Kim's trust. So, when he invited her to a private photo shoot up on Mount Hoop, she of course said yes. This could be her big break, her chance to finally live a decent life. On December 14th, 1982, the pair walked to that secluded area of the woods for Miss Kim's first and last portrait session. As Lee set up his camera, he remarked how chilly it was that day, and offered Kim a tablet, which he said was cold medicine. It'll prevent you from getting sick, he told her. Trust me. Well, she did, and gulped down one of the pills. But it wasn't cold medicine at all. The capsule actually contained potassium cyanide. It wasn't long before her insides began aching, then burning. As she fell down into the leaves, Lee was ready and waiting with his camera. As she begged for help, all Lee did was take her picture, again and again. The last thing she likely saw was the camera's flash before everything went black. Four years later, Mr. Lee's own world faded to black too, when he was executed on May 27, 1986. Before his sentence was carried out, Lee stated, The way a human being dies, it's art. I only took artistic photographs. From the outside looking in, Ramon Sosa was living the dream. The former pro boxer was doing very well for himself back in 2009. He owned a gym in Houston, Texas, was raking in the dough, was attending parties with the rich and famous, and best of all, was about to marry the woman of his dreams, Lulu Dorantes, a Mexican living in the USA on a visitor's visa. Family life suited Ramon well. As all of his friends would tell you, the guy was made to be a husband, and as Ramon himself put it, his loyal fiance Lulu treated him like a king. As one family friend said, she was great. She'd bring him coffee and get up every morning with him and make him breakfast. I just thought it was really neat, their relationship. You know, they got along really well. Everyone thought Lulu was the model partner, kind, generous, and loving. But there was one person who wasn't so keen on her. Ramon's daughter, Mia. Mia knew that the face that Lulu showed the world was really a mask, and that beneath that warm exterior was a cold-hearted woman who only cared about two things, money and herself. Lulu hated Ramon spending money on Mia, or any of his other children for that matter. In Lulu's mind, Ramon's free time and money was reserved for her and her children. Mia would complain about this to her father, but her words usually fell on deaf ears. Ramon had been taken in by Lulu's charms long ago, and for the most part, he sided with his wife. All he had ever seen was the good in her, the mask that she wore. By March of 09, Mia and her father had drifted further and further apart, to the point that when Ramon and Lulu got married, she didn't even attend their wedding. But it seems that Mia wasn't the only one who knew about Lulu's dark side. Just after the couple exchanged their vows and were legally wed, Lulu's mother came up to Ramon and whispered something in his ear. Now she's your trouble. Nonsense, thought Ramon. My wife's no trouble at all. I can trust her. By 2010, Ramon's business was doing so well that he opened up a second gym in Houston, this time with his wife Lulu by his side. She worked alongside him as a personal trainer, 
and also took care of the books. It wasn't long before the couple were making $20,000 a month in profit. But despite the sweetness of all that cash, this was when their relationship started to sour. Lulu began telling her friends that Ramon was lazy and that she was doing the lion's share of the work. Whether that was true or not, Lulu evidently decided she was entitled to a bigger cut of the profits. The gym was getting busier, Ramon was taking on more and more clients, but for some reason, the gym's earnings weren't increasing. He began to suspect that his once trusted wife was stealing money from the business. His suspicions weren't misplaced. Lulu was skimming extra money, and was using it to pay for a divorce attorney. She filed for divorce and made baseless claims that Ramon was violent and physically aggressive towards her. Even so, the couple continued to live together during their separation, albeit on different floors of the house. This is where things took a supremely dark and unexpected turn. The divorcing couple had a mutual friend named Mundo. While Mundo was at their gym, he happened to overhear a conversation that Lulu was having with her daughter of all people. Inside the gym's office, Lulu was saying that one of her customers knew a hitman, a guy from Mexico who chops people up for money, and saying how they could potentially use him to make Ramon disappear. That way, the two gyms would be hers and hers alone, as well as the house, all of Ramon's assets, and the cash from his life insurance policy. After hearing that, Mundo approached Lulu in private and said that he himself knew someone who could do the job for her instead. Someone reliable, professional, trustworthy. Lulu trusted Mundo and told him to set things up with the assassin. But much like Ramon shouldn't have trusted Lulu, Lulu shouldn't have trusted Mundo. Not about to let his friend be murdered, Mundo left the gym and called Ramon. Hey man, Lulu wants to kill you, he said before explaining the entire situation. Ramon was in disbelief. He knew his wife had fallen out of love with him, sure, but he didn't think she'd take things that far. In his mind, hiring a contract killer to take out your spouse was something that only happened in Hollywood movies, not in real life. Not to him. Ramon went straight to the police and asked them to help him, but there was very little they could do without any evidence. So... Mundo and Ramon decided to hatch their own sting operation. Using disposable phones, the two of them would message one another about the fake hit, Mundo playing himself, Ramon playing his own killer. Mundo then showed these messages to Lulu, who, in turn, became more confident that this contract killer was legit. It also made it less likely that she'd go ahead and hire a real killer in the meantime, though that of course didn't stop Ramon from looking over his shoulder during those days. He lived in constant terror that someone was already out to get him, and even slept with a pistol under his pillow, just in case. And remember, during this time, Lulu was still living in the same house as him. All he could do was play dumb and hope for the best. The real turning point in their sting was when Mundo secretly recorded this conversation with Lulu. Now with Lulu on the hook, and with recorded evidence that she genuinely wanted to kill her husband, the authorities were finally able to get involved. They set up a meeting between Lulu and a hitman, a hitman played by an undercover detective. On the night of July 20th, 2015, Lulu drove to an empty parking lot, bringing with her $500 as a down payment for the hit, as well as Ramon's own watches and jewelry. In a sense, she was making Ramon pay for his own execution. Lulu met the undercover agent, paid him, and drove off into the night. With cash exchanged, the cops could now prove intent, but to really give them an airtight case, there was one last thing they had to do. They had to watch makeup tutorials on YouTube. I'm not even joking. From those makeup videos, the detectives learned how to apply some realistic looking makeup onto Ramon's face and make it look like he was a dead body. They had him lay in a shallow grave with a fake hole in his head and took a photo of him pretending to be dead, 
then had a Malay low for three days, so Lulu would think he really was taken care of. Nobody knew where I was, even my family, said Ramon. Everybody was looking for me. I was very, very upset. Rage and sadness. All the emotions came through me. On July 23rd, a final meeting was set up between Lulu and the undercover agent, posing as Ramon's assassin. This time, they were going to film the entire thing. Lulu arrived just as planned, and stepped into the undercover agent's car. It's done, said the agent. We got him today, and this morning. Lulu paid him a thousand more dollars, and after receiving it, the agent took out his phone and showed her the photo of Ramon, dead in a ditch. The dumbass fought, said the agent. He fought, replied Lulu. She then laughed at the thought of it. There was no sense of remorse, or regret, or even shock, as she stared blankly at the picture of her husband. She was ice cold. The agent recounted Ramon's final moments, and how he had pleaded for his life. Well, he won't wake up anymore, Lulu said, before laughing psychotically again. She promised to get the killer the $3,000 she still owed him, then exited the vehicle, and drove off once more. The following morning, officers went to the gym, and asked Lulu if they could talk to her in private. For a few minutes, they acted as if they were doing a wellness check on Ramon, and asked Lulu if she knew where he was. Lulu acted coolly, feigning ignorance, as if she hadn't just tried to have Ramon killed. Finally, the cops ended their charade, and told Lulu she was under arrest. As they led her to the cruiser outside, it finally dawned on her. She had been duped. With so much evidence against her, Lulu took a 20-year plea deal. She also had to give her share of the gym and house to her still very much alive husband, Ramon. The detectives determined that Ramon hadn't physically hurt Lulu like she had claimed, and didn't pursue any charges related to those baseless assertions. The former pro boxer had just survived the biggest fight of his life, and with his now ex-wife's plot foiled and her true nature exposed, he was able to start repairing the damage to his own reputation as well as his relationship with his daughter, Mia. The one thing he'll likely never be able to fix, however, is his ability to trust any romantic partners ever again. Just before we end the video, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. The Nuon Goem, 24, Lydia Glassley, Thomas the Handsome, Alex Greensall, Azriel Warakai, Charlie Lackey, Connor Lothan, Crawford K. MacDonald, Event Horizon Records, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Infamous Sempapi, Leonardo Martinez, Mackenzie Griffin, Maria Mendez, Myra Lancaster, Monica Mendoza, Natalie Escobedo, Palmira, Peter Logjarach, Philip Westra, Procupidine Netta, Ronnie Franklin, Sarah Ramirez, Silas Geist, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, Zane, Miss Crypto, Damian Bennett, Hungry and Hammered, The Deck of Cards, and TNS MOM. Thank you guys so much for your continued support, it really helps the channel out. Well, that wraps things up for this one, guys. Be sure to smash that like button, or I'll smash you. Make sure you're subscribed and the bell icon's clicked, and you'll be hearing from me again very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.